All right. We are tonight in Second Thessalonians. We're picking up in chapter three tonight, verse number one. We're ready for a new chapter. Are we excited? I can tell. Yeah. I can see. Yeah. I can see it on your faces. I can see that you are so excited. I can visualize it on Annie's face because I can't see it, but I can visualize it that uh, she's excited too. So here we go. Chapter three, beginning in verse number one. And it looks like I lost Linda. There she's back. Okay. And I'm sorry if you're having the issue of people's video coming in and out. I don't know why that is, if that's the case for you. And I don't know if everybody's having trouble with that or not. And that's uh, unfortunate. I mean, at some point, we could change to a, an, another app or something, but uh, then we'd everybody have to get up to speed on that. And so I hesitate to do that because I remember how it was getting on this one for us. So <laughs> getting on another one, you know, we can, we need to, but uh, we'll see how it goes because we've, we've had this issue now for a, a little bit. So this could be feedback, you know, when you get a chance and we can switch if we need to make a change. All right, so we're picking up in chapter three of second Thessalonians, verse number one. And this is what it says. It says, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is, as it is with just as it is with you. So that's an interesting expression, isn't it? The word of the Lord would run swiftly. And uh, I, I do have another scripture to show you that uses that same expression. So I'm going to share that with you. And that's not the one I want you to see. Let's see. Uh, here we go. That's it. So Psalms 147, verse 15. Here, let me show you. I haven't started this yet. Here we go. He sends out his command to the earth. This is Psalm 147, verse 15. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs very swiftly. So I think that's an interesting way to, to put it. And so obviously, you know, what that would mean to us, and, you know, the word of the Lord, he's praying that, what is his prayer? So pray that the word of the Lord may run swiftly. In other words, that, we can, in a, you know, in a very short time, we can spread the word of God, right? That we can declare the word of God in, you know, many places in a, in a short period of time. And then he says also, and be glorified, that the word of God would be glorified just as it is with you. So glorified would mean, you know, that God would receive glory and honor. His word would, would be glorified or receive the honor that's due it based on what people receiving it right so if people reject the word of god if people reject the gospel then it's not glorified right it's not given the honor that it deserves it is you know it is uh, avoided and shunned and not embraced but if people receive the word of god and are saved like those that he was writing to at thessalonica then God's word is glorified, or its glory is revealed, and there's honor attached to it, and it's honored and lifted up, and so forth. And that's what he, you know, is praying about. Yeah, we should. That should be our prayer today, also, right? That God's word would have impact in the lives of those that we come in contact in our world today, and it would be glorified in in others, that people would be saved. I know that's your desire. And, you know, the only, you know, I mentioned how wonderful Sunday was, and, and it was, it was, it was really, and we don't know what people were thinking or whatever, but it would have been even better if someone would have come to Jesus during the service, wouldn't it? 
that would have been better. And that would have been you know, even more exciting. And so I know that's your desire. We want to see people saved, don't we? Give mm -hmm. their hearts to Jesus. And you know, then God's word is glorified as it's intended. And God is glorified through his word and, and, and the lives of people who embrace it. And that's what we desire. That's what Paul was asking for. And that's what we desire, right? As people of God, as a, as a church, as a local church body, that, that his word would be glorified in us because... Number one, because we've been transformed through his word, believing the word of God, and God is glorified in our lives as we live for Jesus, and then also that others would receive his word, right, and come to Jesus as well, and that is our hope, and that is our goal, and that's our mission, is for that to be true, and I, I believe that God is going to do that. I hope that you can, I hope that you believe that. I, I think that you do. And perhaps we should ask God for more faith. God, help us to believe that, right? To believe that you're going to send people our way, that we're going to impact people, that people are going to give their heart to Jesus through individuals in our church and through our church as a whole, our ministry, you know, in the days and weeks to come. You know, we have to believe that, don't we? We have to believe that. And and I do believe that. All right. So anybody have a comment or question on what we've talked about so far? No. Okay. All right, let's move on to verse two then. And so he's praying that the word of the Lord would run swiftly or they you know, could quickly spread the word of God to others and be glorified and so forth. And then, and then additionally, in verse 2, he says uh, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. You know, that's the sad truth, isn't it? Everybody's not saved. We know that already, right? Everybody's not a Christian. And there are even those who strongly oppose Christianity, who oppose the work of God. And so this is what they, of course, were experiencing. And that's still true today. There are people who are not really in one you know, are not against the word of God and are, and not really for it. There are people who are nonchalant about God's word. There are people who strongly, you know, receive it and embrace it. And then there are those who are totally against it. And there are those who actively fight against the word of God and the kingdom of God. There are those that Satan has, you know, warring against the church. How many know that? That we're at war you know, spiritually, in the spiritual realm. And Satan actively is fighting the work of the Lord Jesus Christ through his church in these last days. And he does that through, on a spiritual level, you know, through the powers of darkness. And he also does in conjunction with that, does that through people, through individuals who would fight, and not only individuals, but groups of, people and powers and authorities and governments and so forth that would fight against the work of the, of the Lord. And so here's the prayer is that we would, may be delivered from that, from unreasonable and wicked men. So those who fight against God, those who fight against God's word, those who fight against the gospel, are described here as unreasonable. Now, people in the world around us today, those who are not believers, they would say that we are not reasonable because our contention is, and the truth is, that there's only one God and there's only one Savior, Jesus Christ. And there's only one way to heaven. There's only one way given by God for us to be saved. And that's by believing in Jesus Christ who went to the cross and died for all of us that we could be saved. And they don't feel like that's reasonable because, 
you know, what's popular in the world today is just to accept that there are many avenues of making it to heaven or what or what other word people use to describe the afterlife, you know, a great afterlife, you know, a beautiful, glorious afterlife. And, you know, they, they like for all of us just to believe, well, you know, it's all valid. And they're just different ways that you can get, you know, to that final place where, you know, you can live in beauty and wonder and rest and all that. But so they think we're not reasonable when we say, no, no, there's just one way. And that's through Jesus Christ. But in reality, those who contend that are the ones who are unreasonable, described here as unreasonable, not having reason. You know, and re you know, reasonable comes from reason, you know, thinking something through, reasoning it out and coming to a logical conclusion right human beings do that we don't always do that how many know that sometimes we react emotionally and not based on logic or being reasonable right right we just get all oh, you know into our emotions and we get hostile we get angry whatever and we won't you know one expression is we don't listen to reason right sometimes and because that's what human beings are are, are like so <laughs> but the reasonable, logical, the thing that makes sense in reality is to recognize that there is one God. And if there is one God and he's almighty, then how foolish is it to resist him? That doesn't make sense, does it? That's not reasonable to resist God. I mean, Satan resisted God. Look, you know, look where that got him, right? It's, you can't go against God. And why would you want to go against God when God so loved the world, right, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So the reasonable position, so it's reasonable to believe in Christianity. It's reasonable to think that we should not live a sinful life. That That is even not only reasonable, but logical. Why is that? Because... A sinful life is destructive. Most of us are, if not all of us, certain all of us, I just say, are aware of that truth, right? That sin is destructive. It is. We get all caught up into sin, you know, whatever level, if we get into, you know, behavior that is sinful, is has a negative impact on us. Oftentimes, health-wise, you know, physically, it certainly has an impact on us emotionally and mentally, and most definitely has an impact on us spiritually. No good thing comes from sin, does it? It's destructive. And so it's not logical to continue down that road, is it? But it makes all kinds of sense to live a, a good life and a righteous life and a life that pleases God. You now it makes all the sense in the world. So his prayer is that we will be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. So they're not only unreasonable, not using reason, but they also are wicked, not being righteous. And they're against God and against the people of God and against the word of God being promoted and spread. For not all have faith. So there's this truth. Maybe you didn't realize there was so much in this verse, but there's this truth in this verse. The reason that we're saved tonight, the reason that we have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ is because of faith. I know you realize that, right? Faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. Believing on him. Not just believing in him, because there are so many people in the world that will, will say, yeah, I, I accept the fact that Jesus was an historical figure. He really was a man who lived on the earth. They will concede that. Uh, they will also agree with us that he was a prophet. They will agree with us that he was an awesome teacher. 
and preach her, right? And they will agree with us, you know, he was a good person and that we should follow his example and all that. But so they believe in him. For example, I mean, I can add to that those who subscribe to Islam, you know, those who uh, are Muslim in the world today, they believe in Jesus. They believe that he was a prophet. They don't believe he was the savior of the world. They're found, the founder of their faith was Muhammad, and they follow his teachings, but they believe Jesus was a prophet, and they accept that he was a good man and that his teachings are worth taking a look at and following, but they don't believe in him as the savior of the world. They don't accept him as their savior. No, faith is more than believing in Jesus, that he was a person, or believing even in what he said was good. It involves believing on him to be saved, believing that because of what he did on the cross, he did it for us. He did it for us, you know, not only generally, but specifically. You know, I have to believe that Jesus died for my sins so that I could be saved. And I also have to believe that when he did that, it was sufficient that what he did was sufficient to take care of it, that he died in my place and he paid the price. And through him, I have atonement that my sins are forgiven because of what he did. And it's already a, a it's already a fact. My sins are forgiven. And this is left to me to believe on him as my savior. And if I do that, then I am saved by the power of that faith. And so that's what it means here by faith. And then there's something else that we need to look at. Not all have faith. Not all have faith. Everybody in the world doesn't have faith to believe on Jesus Christ. So let me, and I've quoted it many times, but you know, I'll show you again on the screen uh, a verse that we can tie in here. As Romans 10 and 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So let's look at it again. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So a couple things I want you to consider from that verse. Notice the connection to the word of God. Faith comes by the word of God. And he just he just mentioned that he was praying and asking them to pray that the word of the Lord would run swiftly. So that word that is being shared, the gospel of Jesus Christ, through that word, people are saved. And it's saying here that some do not have that. So faith, so the second thing in Romans 10, I want you to look at verse 17, was this. Now faith comes by hearing it comes to us because we don't have it we don't have the faith to be saved we have to receive it from the lord because the faith that comes from him believe on the lord if we have that faith we are saved by that faith in other words it's impossible to have saving faith and not be saved by it if you believe on the lord you shall be saved you are saved by believing on him so if you believe on so follow that logic so if you believe on him you are saved by that faith that automatically causes you to be saved and so it's something we do receive so what does it say now faith comes to us by hearing i don't want any jokes about me not being able to hear okay but, you know, we do hearing, right? Hearing. We have to hear. And hearing is receiving, you know, into our consciousness a sound or sounds. It can be language. It can be you know, any, you know, any sound. 
but to become conscious of that and aware of that, it comes, you know, comes by hearing. And there are different degrees of that. We can hear background noise and not really focus on it. Sad to say, and we all do it sometimes. People can even be talking to you directly, and you're not you're hearing what they're saying, but you're not if you're not focused on what they're saying, you're really not hearing, right? Have we all, have we all done that? We've all done that, and we've had people do that to us, where we're talking to them and they're distracted and their mind is somewhere else. And they heard the noise, but they didn't, they didn't comprehend. They didn't, they didn't hear the words because they weren't thinking about it. That happens, doesn't it? And so here, hearing, so faith comes by hearing, by receiving what God is saying to us with comprehension. Because the Bible is available, you know, and overwhelming quantity i mean you can go in this country at least you know anywhere and, and there's the word of god you can now we have it in written form we can also do it digitally on your phone or your computer right almost all of us have on our phones probably a bible app at least one i have two on mine so you have probably that many or more and you know and you can do it on your computer you can do it you know i have different bibles as well written ones there's all ways but a person can have a bible i mean they still have gideon bibles and motel rooms and things and so it's available it's there and some people even read it but even looking at it and reading it there are people who have phds that have read all the way through the scriptures but still didn't hear what god was saying right because they just weren't open to it so hearing in the sense of this, the context of this verse is hearing, you know, with communication, God is communicating and we're receiving and we are embracing what is being said. God speaking to us. And, and we're, so faith comes by hearing, by hearing God. faith comes when we hear God say to us, you know, come to me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, you know, come and drink of the water of life freely. And what he says to us, Jesus died for your sins, and through him you can be saved. We just believe on him and what he did on the cross. When we hear that in the sense of receiving that and embracing that, then faith is born within us. God, through his word, creates faith in us to believe on Jesus. And when we're open to that, when we hear what God is saying, and we respond. And so, now faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of god hearing god comes through his word what's declared in the word of god you know all that truth you know is shared with us but all men do not have faith wicked men do not and women and you know whatever do not have saving faith it comes to them that's why it's so frustrating for us when we witness to our family members who are not saved, not friends and co-workers, neighbors or whatever, when they're not hearing us, right? When they're not listening to what we're saying, we try to get them to accept Christ. And it's so frustrating. So, well, and you probably throw up your hands, if not literally, figuratively. And you're like, they're not hearing me, right? They're not hearing what I'm saying. You need to be saved. You know, you can be saved. You can, it's be glorious. It's wonderful. You know, you, you've never regretted it. And you can go to heaven, and you know, and, and you, should, you should do that. But they just are not listening. They don't hear us. And it is frustrating, isn't it? And so what they need to do is hear. So now faith comes by hearing, being open to that, and, and really hearing God speak to them. And, of course, that is always accomplished through God's spirit. And he does that through people sometimes speaking through us, speaking or whatever, sometimes directly. To their to their spirit or both and certainly based upon what god's word declares you know we can declare the word god's spirit can you know impart it to them or whatever but it's all based on the word of god so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god so all men do not have faith the wicked and unreasonable men do not have faith but we have 
received God's, we have received faith. And through faith, we are literally transformed and changed through God's spirit because we hear God, we believe on the Lord, Jesus Christ. And by that, we are saved. All right, that was a lot to say. So, wow, I got a headache now. No, I don't. No, just kidding. So, uh, anybody have any comment or question? Speechless as usual, right? Okay, let's go on to verse 3 then. But the Lord is faithful. So that's another variation of faith. You know, all men don't have faith in the transitions, but, you know, even though that's true and do not receive faith, but the Lord is faithful or does that which our faith embraces, right? Our faith embraces what God does. God is faithful. Which in this context means, you know, you can depend on him. Our faith in him is not misplaced. He is faithful or doing that which is faith worthy, if you want to put it that way, right? Worthy of our faith. We can count on him. He's true to his word. He's always present. Does exactly what he says. Right? So God is faithful. The Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. That should give us comfort, right? He will guard you from evil. He will establish you. He will establish you in the faith. And he will guard you from the evil one. So, you know, we're there. We don't have to fear the enemy. The enemy is... Satan is very powerful, very powerful being. And I, I've said that before, you know, and that's not to give him any glory or honor or praise. Because it's not praiseworthy. It's just a fact. He's a very powerful being. And we don't want to make the mistake of underestimating him. Because that's, that gets us into trouble, doesn't it? Because we, so we should recognize that. He's very, very powerful, very worthy adversary as far as being, you know, a force to be reckoned with. Does he compare to, does his power compare to God's? No, of course not. God is all powerful, almighty. Satan is a powerful being that has limited power. He has a lot of power, but it's limited. But God is, God's power is unlimited. But compared to us, Satan is a very powerful being and so and he's out to destroy us he's as he goes about as a roaring lion seeking who he may devour he devours a lot of people in a figurative sense he even some who were thought to be strong and powerful christians he's taken down i mean can't count how many ministers even have fallen in the sin right? Been destroyed. So we want to recognize that that's true. But on the other hand, I want to, again, establish this in your mind, as believers, we should never fear him, because God is with us. We should understand he has a lot of power. And we never want to underestimate him. And we must always understand that it's only through God's power that we're able to overcome him. But we should never fear him because God is with us. God himself guards us. It says, he is faithful. He will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And so even though sometimes we talk about Satan and, and, and Satanism and, you know, we can talk about, when we talked about the Antichrist, we talked about, you know, the, the power that he would demonstrate and signs and wonders and, you know, what we would consider miraculous kind of thing, you know, when he's 
comes to power that will impress people. And, you know, we talk about people who are possessed of devils. I mean, some people think that, you know, I see demons everywhere. I don't. They're real. And everybody's not, everybody run into is not possessed. But I have encountered two people that I know for sure in my ministry that were possessed by spirits. And it is not a fun experience. And so it's not something you want to take lightly. But even when you talk about things like that, some Christians become alarmed to think, oh my, you know, it could be dangerous. And Christians even have had experiences, maybe you have too, where, you know, demonic forces, you know, you recognize they're, in, they're near you and you can maybe have a dream or you can wake up from a dream and think that you see something, you know, it can, it can be terrifying, right? People even in related experiences where they felt like they were being choked by the devil or things like that. That's got to be scary, right? That is. Uh, I may have told you this story before, but we were in, we were in a church in Greensburg, Indiana years ago, back in the 80s. And uh, pastor, you were pastoring in the 80s. Boy, you are old. No, I shouldn't have said that. No, I'm not. Okay. Anyway, clip that out. Clip that out. Okay, so um, so we were at that that church, and and one of the people who was possessed that I encountered actually came to a couple of the services there, and you know, there was a strong demonic presence, you know, around in that area at that time, at least when we were there, and connected with the church maybe through that person. I don't know. Uh, she wasn't there all the time, but you know, this really was, and. So she came to a service once, long story short, you know, and boy, I could really feel the enemy. And she was starting to act up in the service and everything. And we, I called everybody to the altar and praying. She came down to the altar, even though she wasn't sincere. And I, and I laid hands on her and I prayed over her. And she was not delivered from the spirit, but she went quiet and didn't cause any more disturbance in the service. So, and she never came back after that. And sad, you know, she wasn't delivered you have to want to be but we had things that happen and one thing was happening and i'm not making this up you know i don't exaggerate stuff but uh, lorraine and i were praying and at at the house one day in my study at the house and it wasn't the door to my office started to shake and we, we knew that was from demonic forces it was really weird you know and on another occasion, close to that same date, I don't know if it was a week before that, two weeks before that, we came home from Wednesday night uh, Bible study to the house, and the wind wasn't blowing or anything, but the storm door was all the way back, and there was an awning over the storm door uh, to that entrance, to the back entrance, and that storm door was all the way back under that awning, and I guess a person could have done that, but we felt like it was not it was forces of darkness and then the boy said that they in that house the parsonage that there were times we were gone they would hear music and things and lorraine would hear footsteps and I mean, it was really weird situation so there are forces of darkness i'm not there anymore i'm kind of happy about that so anyway uh you know weird things happen but we should never be afraid Right, because we were protected by God, and we always are. And you know, when we sleep or when we wake or whatever, you know, even if the enemy wants to destroy us, which he does, he cannot. God protects us, so we should never fear the enemy. We should make sure we're in good, you know, God's grace, right? <laughs> For sure. But we should never fear what Satan can do to us because God is greater and he will guard us. And just let me share this verse with you. And I know we're coming to a close here pretty soon, but I have another verse. Um, and it's probably not. I'll just go ahead and show it to you. But um, yeah. Let's see. Maybe uh, there we go. And so this is part of the Lord's Prayer. And so this is what we're encouraged to pray, Matthew 6, 13. And do not lead us into the but deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from the evil one. 
That's New King James Version. I know that the King James says deliver us from evil, but all the modern translations say evil one. So if we're delivered from, that makes sense. You know, if you're delivered from the evil, then you're delivered from the evil one, from Satan himself. And so we should be praying that way uh, in conjunction with this idea that God will protect us. One reason he protects us, I mean, he just protects us anyway, of course, to a certain degree. But we should also pray to that end, Lord, deliver us from the evil one, right? We should pray for one another, pray for ourselves. Lord, keep me from the hand of the enemy because he definitely wants to tempt me, you know, and mess up my life and bring harm to my life. But I know that you will protect me and guard me. We can pray over other people. I know you do, right? I know you pray uh, for your friends. I know you pray for your family. Some of you share with me, you pray, certainly pray for your, your children, right? Your grandchildren. And we pray for people in our church. And by all means, by all means, pray for your pastor, right? And, uh, but, you know, God does protect us from the enemy. But we need also to pray that, that he will do that. That's part of that. That's part of that dynamic between us and God. He does do that to a certain degree just because. But then you could add to that by praying also. You know, this is a this is a relationship. You know, there has to be communication between us and God. He wants us to seek him. He wants us to pray about things. They, some things just happen because God's good. But he has designed it so that he wants us to talk to him about everything, right? Don't hold anything back, but bring everything to him. Pray about stuff. And we're involved. And so that, that, that means praying for protection when we go out, praying for protection for, for others, and praying for, you know, that God would work in their lives and, and all that. So it, it's really important that we pray for one another and we pray for our family members and all that, which I know that you do, uh, because that's important, isn't it? It's important. It does matter. It does make a difference when we pray and seek God. All right, so I'll open up to your questions or comments that you might have. Anybody? Yes, Linda. Well, Pastor, I was thinking about the verse about the strong man. Yeah. Somewhere it says that the strong man has to be um, tied up. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, that's talking about the coming of the Lord. You know, we don't know when the Lord's coming. It's talking about a you know, thief in the night. You know, the thief in the night will come. And and uh, in order for him to break in, you know, if, it's, if there's a strong man present, you know, in other words, someone who's there to resist, then, you know, that has to be taken care of before, you know, the thief can do what he wants to do. Um, I believe that's the context of that. But, yeah, that's so true. If there's a... If there's a power force within the house, then, the, then whoever wants to come in cannot do that uh, successfully. And Satan cannot, you know, come against us successfully because the Lord is with us. Anybody else? And you said not to fear that, do you think, why is that, do they, do, would something like that thrive off of fear? Say again, drive off of fear. What would drive off of fear? Like the, um, just like demonic, I, I don't know, like the negative energies and stuff like that. You, you said not to fear or something like that. Yeah. Why is that? So you think it would thrive off of fear? Yes, they they would be attracted by by fear. There's some some theologians that believe in the, the story of Job. I remember the story of Job and all the stuff that happened. Now we know, that God allowed Satan to do all that. And there, there was a conversation between God and Satan as he came before the Lord. But in Job chapter two, you know, Job says, the thing I have feared the most has come upon me. The thing I feared the most has come upon me. 
and everybody doesn't agree, but some theologians believe that that had something to do with it. I mean, that wasn't the whole story. I mean, Job was being tested. Uh, Satan was demonstrating, you know, that Job would serve him no matter what. This could have happened no matter what. But let's just say it didn't help his case any for Job to have that obsessive fear. He said, I'm obsessed with fear. The thing I feared the most, I was so fearful about this. And that has actually come upon me. And what I've read and studied, you know, and I can't prove this, you know, but uh, what I feel is, is true, that we can encourage demonic forces by having fear. Uh, and some have taught, and I've read that, you know, in some of these pagan societies, that's really the driving force. They, they worship these strange gods and so forth, which are just a front for demons, really, these strange foreign gods. And their fear, they fear so much their gods. And that just attracts those spirits even more. And they, they're held in bondage by fear. Satan uses fear to hold people in, in bondage. You know, in 1 John chapter 4, you know, it says that that love, will, you know, perfect love will cast out fear out of our heart. It says that, you know, fear, um, about fear. And so that's important. And it also says in Hebrews chapter 2 that all of our lifetime, those who are uh, of humanity, Satan has held captive through fear, the fear of death, the fear of death, the fear of, of dying, and all that goes with that because of sin. So fear is associated, you know, with Satan, really, and seems to attract satanic forces because fear is not of God. And then I could reference, you know, Second uh, Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, but God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. God has not given us a spirit of fear. You know, we've overcome fear. So fear is of the enemy, the fear of death, the fear of the consequences of our sin, the guilt. Adam and Eve, after they sinned in the garden, they were afraid. You know, they hid themselves from the Lord because they were ashamed and they were afraid and the glory of God had left them. And he, they finally came out when God called to them. They finally came out and, and, and they said, we heard, we heard you coming, we heard your voice, and we were afraid. So fear is not from God. Fear is from the enemies. Fear is from sin. Fear is being ashamed. Fear is a, a punishment of of destruction of bad things happening, all that. Satan uses that against people. So that's the worst thing we can do. And that's why I say Christians should not fear Satan because he uses that against believers, our own fears, right? Can be our own worst enemy because fear is not faith. Faith brings courage. Faith brings trust, you know, and uh, you know, the, the belief that everything's going to be all right and God is protecting us, you know, and it gives us calmness and all that. Whereas fear is the opposite. You know, Satan can use fear uh, when we're sick, you know, we're facing disease and things. Uh, he can use fear. Or he, can, he can just cause us to go into total panic about life and about people around us and our concern. And we should be concerned about people and we should pray for them. But we should not allow ourselves to be overcome by fear because Satan can use that against us like he did to some degree at least i think in the life of job and so we can see that so fear is not our friend it is in certain terms you know the fear of danger is god, something god's given us so we don't walk out in front of traffic or whatever right but so that's a good thing but you know the kind of fear we're talking about is not is not good so does that answer your question at all yeah, not too bad for off the cuff, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? I got one. Yes. How about anger? Anger is another emotion. So I should broaden that to say, and I have preached this before, Satan uses our emotions against us. Fear is one of them. Anger is another one. You know, and all these things we are, we have resident within us. These are things that are a part of of our humanity, our emotions, and we are fully capable 
of being angry ourselves or having fear ourselves or whatever, but he magnifies those things. He does. He comes against it and he magnifies them and makes them so much greater than they are on their own to where they can just be overwhelming. You know, and what we should say, you know, is I don't need any help, right? How many agree? We don't need any help in being afraid or whatever. Uh, and so that's what he does, though. He does use our emotions against us. That's one around we need to understand, you know. So if you're going through a hard time, I mean, you're certainly capable of feeling down, depressed on your own. But Satan comes against us and tries to magnify those things. So they're much greater than they otherwise would be. And it can be over, you know, quite overwhelming. But God gives us peace, right? God gives us peace and gives us strength. Anybody else? All right. Thank you for the input. Thank you for the questions. And uh, thank you for sharing. Looks like we lost Annie along the way somewhere. But we didn't lose the rest of you, at least. That's good. Okay, so let me turn off the recording. Well, you can say your 